Hi there and welcome to our Facebook Live. Now this has been brought to you by Evergreen. Thank you very much to the team there. And I'm going to be covering some marvellous topics of something that is very passionate to me as well as it is to many of you and that is our gardens and you know we've had a bit more time to spend on them than we normally would have thought to of this month. But there is a magic connecting ourselves with nature. I've had a strong belief that the positive power of plants, the engagement with nature plays a significant healthy uh, environment for us all to live in. I dropped a poll out across all social media and asked a simple question. I did this only uh, uh, about a week or so back and I said, do you think that getting close to plants, gardens and nature has a positive impact on your physical and mental well-being? Well, we got the answers back. 34 people said, no, it didn't. 11,500 said yes it did. So we know it's the magic. The garden is more than just plants of course. It's water pistols with the kids. It's the scent of honeysuckle in the air. It's the sound of the birds and the bees. It's barbecuing. It's relaxing. It's the scent of cut grass. All of those things. It's our part of the planet and engaging with gardening has such a healthy pursuit and it's great fun too. And if you're a plant lover like me, it's never ending. Every season, every week, every day, every hour, we get some magic and beauty from the plants that we have. I, I just want to do a big shout out before we start on this. I am going to, a lot of questions have been sent in to me and um, our friends at Evergreen and Miracle Grow have kindly uh, given us some, um, this is their performance organics, it's pretty serious stuff for feeding and looking after plants. Um, I'm going to give one of these away to one of the questions that uh, I read out towards the end, so there'll be a lucky winner on that. Um, I just wanted to do a big shout out um, because it was the National Hedgehog Awareness Week just the other week and we were looking at uh, focusing in on trying to encourage people to cut a little hole in their fence so little hedgehogs can go from one garden into another. So if you can, just make, you can just take up, if you take a look on the Hedgehog Preservation Society's website, of which I'm uh, uh, very honored to be one of their patrons, um, it's a way of taking care of our little hedgehogs uh, in the UK, and they need our help because they, they roam all over the place. If they can't get out of a garden, they just walk all the way around and they might get close to the road. So please, please, Find a moment to save our hedgehogs by enabling them to, to, to walk around our gardens very freely. They'll pay you back. They will pay you back. 40 slugs in a night they can eat. Not their favourite food, but certainly on their, uh, uh, on their menu. Um, so I thought I'd cover a load of different things to help you. Uh, I'd like to talk about some really special plants for this month. I'd like to break some myths as well. Um, and uh, I'd like to talk about plant food, uh, try to disseminate. You get all sorts of different things with plant food. Is it a first, you know, fertilizer? Is it chemicals? Is it liquid? Is it granular? I'm going to break the myths of fertilizer and give you some great hints and tips for you to feed and take care of your plants in your own garden. I'm then going to have a little bit of a chat about lawns because we have been spending some of our time in our gardens. In fact, I've never heard so many lawn mowers in my neighborhood going off with everybody's free time. So I'm going to talk about grass seed particularly. I'm going to talk about feeding lawns a little bit later on in our series. But this one, if you've got any gaps in your lawn, that penalty spot, the area where the kids play, we're going to cover all of those to help your grass grow and for you to be able to make all of your lawn look perfect. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about growing your own in small spaces, activities kids can do with grow bags and the like. So there's, there's quite a bit to talk about. Big news is, of course, should have been going to Chelsea. Chelsea Flower Show coming up. And do you know, this year at Chelsea Flower Show will be my 40th year. Cripes, am I that old? That's good. Um, the Chelsea Flower Show celebrates its time, but it can't go ahead. Because of the virus, um, the, uh, the, the Chelsea Flower Show at uh, um, uh, its location at the Royal Hospital at Chelsea uh, won't be taking place. There is a virtual Chelsea Flower Show the RHS are organising. You can find more about that on the rhs.org.uk. But I thought, having spent so many years uh, at that show, that I'd highlight some of my favourite plants. Um, and now garden centres are open. Yes, 
I've been campaigning for that for ages. We can get access to plants. So uh, now the garden centres are open, I thought I'd share with you some plants that are, uh, uh, shall we say, Chelsea heroes and have been for, for decades um, that might tempt you to embellish your own garden so you can have your, your own Chelsea experience at home. Because that's what it's about. Chelsea's aiming to inspire people. It's not just about show gardens. We naturally think it's all those big Main Avenue show gardens you see uh, on the BBC coverage. It's not. It's the floral marquees as well. It's the heart of Chelsea when you go into that marquee. If you've never been before, first thing that hits you is the fragrance. You walk in and you just smell the plants around. It's marvellous. When I started going to that show, it wasn't that marvellous sort of like pristine structure that they've got. It was a tent. It was a huge tent and it creaked like an old galleon ship. As you heard the ropes tension and if the wind blew. And I was only a young apprentice there. Uh, there wasn't so many on hose pipes. You had to go with watering cans up, fill them up at the stanchion points and water the plants. Anyway, I've done loads. We've, we've done, uh, I've done many different show gardens at Chelsea. Uh, the last one I did was for the Commonwealth War Graves Commission for their centenary. But I've also um, done a couple of the floral exhibits inside as well as one of the science and education ones. It's a marvellous show. So listen, if you're looking to tempt something, uh, tempt yourself to, to plant something different, something that evokes the feeling of Chelsea, you can't go far wrong with this plant. Now, every show has its particular plant, but the Allium, I'm sure if you Google Chelsea Flower Show and you image search, it'll be full of these babies, is in fact a ornamental onion. So this is the, the flower. If you let your normal onions grow, they, they produce flower. Not as colourful as this, but uh, 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 this is the one. And um, so it sends up this large shoot. And, you know, most of the exhibits inside the floral marquee have uh, these in the allium growers and the like, and in the show gardens too. They're a real, real treat. Look at the flowers on that. And it's not just loved by us. The bees and the butterflies, they love it too. And there's a massive one. Um, this is um, uh, Gigantium, it's one of the larger ones. The only thing, I've used a lot of these in my show gardens, it takes so much energy to throw off this flower at the top, the foliage, it burns out the foliage. The foliage always looks rubbish. So whenever we plant them at, at, at Chelsea and the like, we usually grab a few other shrubs to uh, plant slightly in the foreground to, to, to mask the, uh, the tatty foliage. But that's the case. But that is really iconic Chelsea, the Alliums. Now, if you will wait later on Hampton Court Palace Flower Show, um, uh, you, it's really the Agapanthus because it's timings. These are very earlier and Agapanthus are later. But this globe type flower seems so popular at the flower shows itself. Now, sticking with the purple theme, the Lavenders is also another really good Chelsea flower show uh, um, variety. And there's not just the floral marquee on the inside, I say the gardens as well. Many different varieties of lavender. You may notice a slight similarity in the colour there. Still passionately loved by our birds uh, uh, with the small insects that are getting round. And of course our bees and our butterflies too. And of course, oh, lovely fresh fragrance. We should have more fragrance in our gardens. They work really well. So you get the colour and the effect. And of course, they're evergreen too. Now, one of the first exhibits, I worked for uh, Knotcuts. So my first Chelsea was on the show team at Knotcuts. They were a big grower that had a major uh, show feature in the centre of the Floral Marquee where the big obelisk uh, was. Um, and uh, they took over a nursery called Waterers near Bagshot, Surrey. And I worked with these guys. And, it was rhododendrons and azaleas. And you know, for me, it's not about the open flower. I like seeing the closed flower here, just erupting into color in bud. And that energy and that hope, I was born in spring, you see, there's that element of waiting for it to come into flower that's just so magical. Now these are of course like Ericaceous store, they're lime haters. So if you are planting things like there's a Japanese azalea here or evergreen azalea, um, which uh, both of those prefer uh, a, a more acid soil. So, you know, something like sulfate of iron, Miracle Grow do a sulfate of iron. Um, I think if you, if you add that into the food to help or into the soil to help them grow, or if you're growing them in tubs and containers, because there are many dwarf varieties. In fact, the Japanese azalea just there is perfect for growing in uh, tubs and containers. Um, adding in something like sulfate of iron. I'm coming on to talk about food in a minute, but that's a real, real plus. Um, what else have we got? I always like new varieties and unusual things coming out. Um, 
I've got to pick up this little conifer. They're making me reach here and it's come out of the pot. Um, but these are really nice. The thing about Chelsea is there's always new varieties and things like that that you see at the flower show. Um, this particular one here has been out for a bit and it's a, uh, it's a Picea and it's called Daisy's White. But look, a conifer looks like a Christmas tree, but this lovely golden effect all the way around the outside. How beautiful is that? Econifers are often underestimated, but we see them featured at Chelsea. So get that balance in between flowers and evergreens to make a, a, a real difference in your, your home. I'll put that back down here. A couple of other varieties. I've got to show you this one um, before I go on to plant food, uh, which is really cute. I thought of a perfectly named plant. Uh, it's a little Hebe. Hebe's are very popular with uh, butterflies and, and, uh, and bees as well. Uh, this one here has a, a creamy, uh, yellowy creamy outer leaf with a pink variegation. Guess what they call it? Rhubarb and custard. What a perfectly named plant. So this is another great one in borders or in containers too. It flowers as well. You get that balance to it. Other plants like Pyrrhus, another big Chelsea favourite. So that's the colour of the leaf. It's not a flower. It's called a brac, which is the, which is the leaf that effectively helps to attract uh, insects over. Not to be mistaken by Fertinia, which is that big, thick, uh, uh, red-leafed uh, uh, plant. And a last one here that I can't go on without mentioning. Ladies' mantle. A Camilla mollis. It has quite a phenomenal ability with water tension on the surface of its foliage. So after it rains, the rain droplets look like little pearls held all the way through. These are the flowers, green flowers. But this is a very good front board of filler if you're building Chelsea Flower Show gardens because it enables you to cover around the front. So there's a whole host of colours. Do get a chance to go to garden centres. Uh, they are operating safe gui guidance line and social distancing and everything. Support your local garden centre. Please follow them on their Facebook page because garden centres will give you great local and regional news to weather and things like that. So engage and team up with garden centres. It's packed with really knowledgeable people. I spent a decade of my life in a plant advisor advising people and they, most of the teams in the garden centres have horticultural knowledge and will be able to help you with a whole host of questions. Now feeding plants is very important. One of the things we get asked, if you're preparing plants for the Chelsea Flower Show, how do you do it? Well, intense feed intense care. You know, if, if I was growing to have 10 azaleas in the garden, we'd probably grow about 100 and then only choose the best 10. But in your own gardens, feeding is very important. So let me ask you a question. You wake up in the morning, you have a bit of breakfast. You may have a couple of cups of tea and a biscuit. Then you have a lunch, afternoon, if you're lucky, there may be a little snack, packet of crisps. Uh, and then you have a full dinner in the evening with drink. So we need to feed ourselves to live, like most living organisms. When was the last time you fed your houseplants? When was the last time? We seem to think that if we grow them and put them on the windowsill, that they just do themselves. It's the same with anything. If you feed plants, it's not just about the abundance of colour through foliage and flower and fruit and roots as well, but it's also about the health of the plant as well. If you're looking for pots that perform to this sort of basis with many, many flowers that keep repeating and growing, it's by giving them a little bit of food. So if we're feeding plants, you will get phenomenal results. Now, the issue is, is there's so many differences. If you go into a garden centre, there's packets and packets. There's, you know, uh, what, do you, what do you do? Fish, fish, blood and bone, one's called. Super feed is another. Is it a liquid? Is it a tablet? Is it, is it granular? Well, I'll give you some hints and tips just on the basics of, of what you can add into your own uh, uh, shed or greenhouse that will make a big difference, that will make a big difference to the plants that you grow. Let's start by house plants. We mentioned them earlier on. I love plants, especially indoors as well. They clean the air inside our homes as well. This Dracaena, this is Dracaena marginata, was tricolour actually. It's got three uh, 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 um, shades to its leaf. It's got pink on the outer, then a green. It's got quite cream in there as well. Very good for taking out uh, toxins that build up inside the home from cleaning products and gas fires and, and uh, antiperspirants, etc. So feeding plants is really good. Now, half the time people say, yeah, but it's all that mixing stuff and whatever. The one good thing, what miracle Grow's got is they've got this pump and feed. So it's already mixed in there. And what you do, <laughs> 
There's no mixing, no nothing. You just give it a squeeze at the top and then it puts liquid straight into the top of the plant like that. A little squeeze, there we go, straight in. And then water it afterwards so it mixes it up and takes it through the compost itself. You can do that every couple of weeks and you will see the difference. You will see the difference, the colour of the foliage that goes, if it's a flowering plant, more production, and the roots, everything, it makes a real difference. So you, th there's an orchid one as well. They've also got this little dripper that you can just stick in the top and it slowly drips out. But pump and feed, if you've got orchids, there's one for that, and you've also got one for general house plants. They work well. No mixing, no nothing. You can put it in the, under the sink, you know, with the rest of your, your products. So as you go to clean the sink, it reminds you, oh yeah, I'll feed the house plants. And it's clean and there's no mess and that works. So clean your house plants works really well. Now, containers, you do need to feed because it's not like normal soil where if they're growing straight into the ground with a slight help of the worms and, and, and leaves and other debris falling down that it's, it's breaking down. You've got a very confined uh, uh, soil um, in, inside the container. So you need to add supplementary feed because plants will take the energy of the compost out pretty quickly. Easiest way is just to buy one of those plastic watering cans, 10 litre ones, something similar. And then mix in a little bit of liquid food. This is a miracle Grow one here, it's the all-purpose, so you don't need to have loads of different types of bottles, you only need one. Follow the instructions on the back, the caps are a measure so you can pour it in and it tells you how many litres per capful uh, and the like, and then just tip that into your watering can, mix it up with a bamboo cane, and then just leave it. And use that to water every week or whatever like, so you're watering a little bit of food, so you don't water the food in all the time. Follow the instructions on the bottle, they're really clear. Superb markings with graphics there to tell you exactly how to do it. You know, half the time if you look at anything that you buy, you just can't really pick up what's on there. These are clear graphics explaining how to do it. And it's as simple as that. Mix it and have a feeding watering can on a regular basis for anything, geraniums and fuchsias and I love those summer plants, lantanas and the like, that'll keep going. Now, if you're growing your own, and this is the other thing about Chelsea that I really like, you've got the fruit section with it. Now this is a lovely, it's a blackberry. Um, I planted one of these in the garden earlier on. Um, and the thing about blackberries is you get really beautiful flowers. And then of course they produce the blackberries and our kids love picking them. You pick them fresh, drop them into natural yogurt, very healthy something about having it growing in the garden. Thorns are a bit of an issue, but there's no worry. This particular one, Triple Crown, is a thornless variety. Look at that. No scratching. You know, it doesn't look as if you've had your hands massaged by it. You know, Freddy Krueger. It's an easy pick and they just keep producing. So if you've got an empty fence panel, put one of those on and they go well. So fruit and veg do need a food. The best one that I like doing is sulfate of potash, particularly targeted to help boost the food needed for fruit and flowers. And if you want to know what it looks like, because it's not, not horrible or, or they're just little, little balls like this. They look like polystyrene balls, actually. They're not, they're a bit heavier than that. But added that into, the, uh, into your borders. Follow the instructions on the back. It's like feeding chickens. I never like fertilizer getting too close to the stem or leaving any of the fertilizers on leaves. So just get it at the base or dig it into the ground when you're about to plant. And you will find the fruit and the vegetables, it's not, just about, um, it's not just about foliage, it's about the uh, performance of the plant with, the, um, with what it produces above the ground effectively. So there's, there's different types of feeds, some that focus in on foliage, some that focus in on flower and fruit, and some that focus in on roots as well. And let's go to the root one. Bone meal here is probably one of the best ones, general fertilizers, that you can spread, best to wear gloves when you're doing it, not that it's harmful as such, but it's always better to protection with anything that you're using outside. So if you spread that over the surface of the soil, it's a root booster. And if you boost the roots of the plant, it is the anchor and the, the main part that's taking food back into, it also helps with the foliage as well, there's nitrogen content in here to help too. But bone meal is a really good, if you've got borders of plants, shrubs and trees, you can sprinkle that over the surface of that and it'll get into the soil and help the plants be healthier as they go. Another good general one is chicken manure. Uh, I've got to say, just at the off, if you are growing rhododendrons and azaleas and the like, chicken more 
can be a little bit alkaline and, and cause some more difficulty. So I wouldn't use them if you've got a lot of ericaceous plants, but general fertilizer is great. And you think it's manure, it's horrible. It's not actually, it's pellets. So you, chicken manure, you, you, well, I suppose you spread it like you're feeding chickens, you know, just out like that, around in general borders, and that will put some energy back in. Um, there is a really easy one. If you've got tubs and containers, or even house plants, you can use these here. They are, in fact, uh, slow-release tablets. Uh, they're called, uh, it's miracle Grow Push and Feed. They're like loads of little gobstoppers. And they start to dissolve down with moisture and warmth. Therefore, if you've got them outside during the winter, they won't be breaking down and the plant won't be needing the food because it's in its dormant stage. But during the active uh, uh, um, growth, they work pretty well. And one of these pushed into a pot like that will end up feeding a plant for up to six months, which is really good. I've got to say one thing before we move on, you've got to feed the soil as well. The soil is one of the biggest living things in your garden. Microorganisms there, so archaea, algae, bacteria, fungus, protozoa, you know, virus, all underneath the soil. In fact, there is more microorganism life in one handful of soil than there are humans on this planet. So the soil is a living thing. And if the soil's healthy, it, it combines to helping plants grow as well as helping them to be able to take up food. So I've got it at the back here. I didn't put it at the front. I don't know whether you can see it over there. Let me move these out of the way. Um, it's a big, heavy bag. Organic blend farmyard manure. If you add that farmyard manure into the soil, you're helping. You're helping in so many different ways. That organic matter will make your soil much more uh, uh, acceptable and vibrant for microorganisms, which will help everything that grows in the garden. If the soil is healthy, all the plants are too. Well, that's quite a bit. That's broken down so the different things. So there's a houseplant feed, nice and easy liquid feed for your tubs and your baskets and the like. Sulfate of iron for rhododendrons and azaleas. Sulfate of potash, that works well with fruit and flour. Chicken manure is a good general one, and a root builder is the bone meal. Having some of those boxes, they're not expensive by any stretch of the imagination, and feeding your soil and feeding your plants will generate huge success, and you will be able to have your own Chelsea Flower Show garden just in your own garden. It's magic. Uh, Let's take a look at lawns now and grass seed, something that I've been doing quite a lot of. The only problem is, is I've, I've got the fattest pigeons in Warwickshire. I keep coming down, trying to eat my grass seed. Because uh, I've had, I've had, there's a whole host of things. Because the penalty spot, um, <laughs> that, that ends up bold pretty quickly. Uh, I've got a couple of girls who uh, run riot around their little tree houses and things. Um, I had a mole in the back garden as well, and there's an element of scuffing where the cars are parked. Just, you know, the general. Um, so putting down grass seed now, because it's been so very mild, all we need to do is add some moisture as well. Um, you can gap up all the holes in your lawn, or if you just want to give your lawn a thicker, more healthier appearance. I mean, lawns are marvellous. <laughs> they are marvellous. I always like the scent of cut grass because it reminds me of the school playing fields being cut. I don't know if you, you remember uh, 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 that. Because you, you smell the cut grass, you're thinking, summer holidays are coming up, summer holidays. So it always associates your mind, whenever you smell cut grass, there's a, there's a happy memory locked in. We were talking about fragrance of lavender earlier on. Our memories are locked up with, uh, with fragrance. It's the magic of plants. I always like mint as well, the fragrance of mint and rosemary. And, oh, what, what can you do? So grass really works well. It's also great for the wildlife, for the bees and the birds as well. And uh, it's great for drainage too, because the rain comes down, it goes. So rather than block paving or decking uh, or, uh, or normal paving, you can have a lawn area as well as to, to thoroughly enjoy. And it's great for the pets too. Um, so um, let me give you, give you some advice. There's lots, you walk into grass seed, you see shelves of stuff. I'm gonna give you four really clever uh, um, grass seed options, um, and there are many more um, that Miracle Grow do, and uh, hopefully you, you'll, you'll find some advice to be able to get your lawn up to tip top nick. Uh, first one here is Patch Magic. It's really a dog spot repair, it says, so where you've got a, an element of where you, you've got markings. Basically, uh, you get damage to the lawn, it's mainly the lady dogs rather than the gent dogs, because the gent dogs spray, so it goes over a, a wider area, but the lady dogs concentrate in and that, that build up 
causes spots within the uh, within the lawn. You can actually buy some uh, thing online that enables you to put it into the dog food to try and stop that uh, that burning. Um, but the best thing to do is if you've got those marks, is to go outside and pour water so it dilutes the concentrate of the urine into the into the lawn. But uh, you can patch it up. I mean, it's really good. The, the secret with grass seed, if you've mixed it up with some compost, say some, say some uh, um, peat-free compost, you help the grass seed retain more moisture, enabling to germinate, but uh, more importantly, uh, hide it from the pigeons, um, but uh, also to put it in the right environment so they, they're not growing into stone or hard ground. They've got a soft start and they germinate a lot quicker. I really like this. This is particularly for spots that you've got, not just dog, but as I say, uh, other areas. What I do is where you've got the, the bulb patch, uh, lightly fork the soil over, clear away any debris or weeds, so it's just fluffed up a bit. So it gives a chance for the roots to establish. And then it's got a really handy cap, this one here. It flicks open, and those little uh, markers at the end, as you shake, disperse it widely. But I'm, for the purpose of this demo, I'm just going to show you onto this, um, onto this plate. So I'm going to put a bit of it here and show you, show you what you get within this. You don't apply it like that, you shake it like that of course, but uh, what you've got here is a mixture. It's a dry mixture of uh, seed within there uh, uh, and everything that it needs to germinate and produce healthy. So you put that in the ground and then you water it. The dry sections here suddenly become soft and expand. So I'm going to show you here, I've just got some water. Here we go. Um, so you put that on your ground where the bold spot is and then you add a load of water and as you can see it's starting to expand up so it stops becoming I'm trying to bend this down to show you and hold it up at the same time so where it's been dry it's suddenly become lovely moist area of uh, um, compost to be able to help the the seed germinate so that way you can just sprinkle it in patches that you've got and it mixes up with this substrate here and it gives everything right for it to germinate. Now if you've got a bigger area that you want to, uh, you want to cover and you want to cover it fast to germinate, you can get hold of this. Four days in germination. Gripes, you can almost see the plant grow. You know, um, this is the uh, fast grass. It's a rapid germinator. I would mix it up with a bit of peat-free compost or something similar just to, to make sure it, it, it takes even further. But you can, here's the really good bit about it. Have a look on the side here. You just pull down this section here like that, take that off, and that exposes small areas that enables you to start shaking the seed. I've taken half of it off, so you can do it in a small area, but you can take the whole lot of it off to cover a wider area, and then you literally just sprinkle that out and it enables you to germinate very quickly a small lawn area. Now, if you really want to thicken the lawn, this is a great product. And again, it's got one of these side patches that you just pull up like that and lift up into position. And as you can see just there, very much like the last one, you've got a series of holes that enables you to shake to be able to set it out. And it does a couple of things. First of all, it's got the seed in it to germinate and thicken your lawn. It's also got a feed in it as well and a soil enricher too. So you can add this to your lawn if it's looking a little thin, just to go over the top to feed what you've got, embellish the soil and thicken up that lawn with lots of fresh green grass. Now I'm often asked, what about shady positions? And I've got a, uh, I've got a beautiful weeping willow that's in the lawn. Um, but it's very difficult for things to grow underneath it, of course, not just because it takes the moisture, but also it's the shade as well. And there's a very good product here. It's a shady lawn seed mix. So if you've got that area where, okay, David, you're saying about the spots with the dog and the kids with the football, and you're saying how to thicken the lawn, but we've never been able to grow anything down the bottom of that garden, and it looks a right mess. This is the type of thing that you can do. Cultivate the soil down there, bit of peat-free compost over the top, sprinkle into, uh, into it some uh, shady mix, and you have got it working really well. And that'll start generating more grass in there. So there we have it. Short thing, I'm making your lawns look great. Okay, um, I've got to have a quick chat about um, uh, growing plants in uh, grow bags. I get a lot of people asking me about, uh, you know, they, they've only got a courtyard, a balcony. Someone says, I've only got a step outside the back garden. I can't grow anything. You can. 
Anything that holds soil gives you the ability to grow things further. And the grow bags work particularly well. 1973, look at that, 47 years old, right? Oh, it's older than me. There we have the grow bag. It is a traditional one, it's been about for years and it's got all the right blend of compost within it to be able to uh, help you grow at home, wherever you are. You can spike a few holes in the back, of course, for a little bit of drainage. Then you just cut out with a knife, these squares in here, tuck them back and plant straight into them. It's been about for years, for years. Now, there has been a slight upgrade Levington's have also brought out, it's all part of the same company, Levington's Miracle Grow Evergreen, um, the Tomorite uh, grow bag here as well, and it is a giant tomato planter, and it's got much more inside of it than uh, the other grow bag, so it enables you to, it's better, it can hold more moisture, and it can also um, give you the opportunity for more fertiliser within that as well and it enables you to grow deeper rooting plants, of course, which will help produce much more crops. So you can cut out the squares at the top and plant directly into. One more type, this is a really nice one here. It's a performance organic, so it's a really organic planter in itself. Uh, under the Miracle Grow brand, um, it's ideal. It's got two slots there to grow. So if you've got a much smaller step, or if you want to, to, to grow um, on balconies and the like, this works well too. So all three of them are suitable for growing plants um, in confined spaces. Great for the kids too. Grow bag each, take them to the garden centre, let them shop around and choose what they put on, especially if it's vegetables as well, because the secret of getting kids to eat vegetables is get them engaged with vegetables before it even ends up on the plate. So get your kids a grow bag each, and let them shop and choose the plants to put in them. So. What do we put in uh, grow bags? Let's just take a look at this one here. Obviously, it's got to be tomatoes is the one that's highly mentioned. Tomatoes. If you could buy three things, get yourself a Levington's grow bag, get yourself some tomato plants, and of course, get yourself some tomato food as well. Tomorite, that has been about for years. Now, that will enable you to grow. Uh, I've got to be honest. I was thinking of bringing in some of my tomatoes that I had outside of the greenhouse. But those, that frost that we had the other day, I don't know whether you had it there, it's taken a lot of the veg out. And um, in addition to that, some of the trees, the new foliage on the trees, Illyria dendron I've got in the garden, a variegated one, a beautiful plant. All the leaves have been tinged with that as well. So uh, here's a tip. There's many different ways. Some people, I bought a load of these, which are little cloches just to give them a bit of protection. You know, you don't have to spend a fortune. <laughs> Just take the tops off these, cut the bottom. They also work as little protectors for plants like uh, uh, tomatoes and the like, sweet corn and the like, when we're getting late, uh, getting late frosts. So these survive because it was in the greenhouse, producing these from seeds. Look at these little plants here. So you can plant two of them into the straight into the grow bag like that. There's a couple of canes that you need. You can put in there as supports too. Let them grow up. Feed them with tomari as they go, and they will be producing great tomatoes for you and tomatoes are so full of vit vitamin c and vitamin k they are really good for uh, 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 for, for all of us and of course that flavor that zesty flavor that you get with tomatoes there's only one plant that really really does it even more than tomatoes for me and that's this lovely little plant the strawberry i love them always my favorite I take the kids to pick your own now. Uh, we grow some at our own homes, but they go and one in the basket, one in the mouth, one in the, yeah, you know the game. Um, and don't, I mean, this is a beautiful, this is pink panda. Look at the flower, forget the fruit. It's just a good looking plant. <laughs> so you could grow this one, three of these in a grow bag and grow your own strawberries in it. It's not just about tomatoes. You just plant them straight up like that and they look gorgeous. Uh, in addition to that, you, of course, flowers as well. You just, if you've got no space, you want a bit of colour by the back patio that you're looking out into the garden and you want it just by the conservatory windows, a decent sized grow bag like this giant tomato planter here, you can actually plant colourful flowering plants. I love this. Look at that. Almost velvet in its colour. These little violas. So you can plant up your grow bags with flower colour as well. Of course, another a really big one is, uh, is herbs. Growing herbs in grow bags, you can create a micro herb garden that you can be picking fresh 
from the back patio straight into the kitchen. So what we got on the old menu? Okay, um, I've got to be straight with them. Like a lot of grow bags, you'd be better to grow them in for a year and then plant the plants back outside. Many people that grow things, it's the same with growing in containers. If you're growing a, a rosemary bush in a, in a container, uh, eventually, of course, they get really big plants. So you can grow them for the first year and then plant them out afterwards and you've got a very established plant that you're returning back to your border. So, well, we're at it, I'll talk about rosemary. So there's no harm in you getting it started in a grow bag and then transplanting it afterwards. And of course, with the lamb dishes, it's really gorgeous. I think it's very high in vitamin B6, which is good for the immune system. And of course, the purple flowers, the bees love them too. So you could just plant one into there and then you've got that growing in the back garden. So that's great for your, for your uh, lamb dishes. Uh, what have we got here? A little bit of thyme. Ooh, lovely fragrance thyme. Another bit of kitchen plant. Just plant that into another square that you've got there. Uh, parsley, this is French parsley here. Let's put a bit of French parsley. I'll cut that one in there. Uh, some chives work particularly well. Another purple flowering plant, good for the bees, but great for salads and the like. Plant that in. Uh, sage. Oh, sage and butter, ravioli, gorgeous. That into there, and finally, I mentioned it really earlier on, the scent of mint. Cast me back to a, a little boy picking the mint for the mint sauce, which was a favorite of mine for the, uh, uh, for, for, for the lamb dishes into there. Look at that. That's a whole herb garden, just in two grow bags. You can't go wrong. And of course, as they grow, at the end of the year, you can plant them into your borders and you get established plants on the back of that. Well, we've done quite a lot in my time. Look, we've had a chat about Chelsea Flash Show plants. We've talked all about the different types of feeds that you can do. We've had a good chat about repairing uh, your lawn with, with lawn seed. And we've had a look at a whole host of different ideas that we've, uh, we, you can do just with a simple grow bag and the garden centres are open. Get and support your local garden centre and treat your own garden with something really special. Okay, I've got a couple of things to do here. One, I've got this uh, bottle of uh, all-purpose concentrate for performance organic. It's a real, really nice bit of kit. Um, I've got to choose at random. These are all different questions everybody's sent in. So what have we got here? Um, Carleen Eastham. Carleen Eastham. Now, first of all, we're getting one of those in the post here. Thank you very much for your question. You said, David, I'm growing a garden and I bought some veg plants. Uh, the compost and the raised beds didn't arrive in time, so I've just planted them straight into garden soil. Any tips on helping them thrive? Um, and uh, the raised beds, I'm gonna plant them in things that are available. So, best thing to do, as I mentioned earlier, sulfate of potash is a really good general feed. If you're looking for plants to take up food really quickly, Liquid feed gets taken up faster. Um, and, and, and the granular ones are more long-term, that they're in the soil and you don't have to feed on a regular basis because they're within the soil area. So sulfate of potash for the veg plants, but make sure you sprinkle it around and so it's not touching the foliage itself or the stem and as the water uh, managed to take that in. And the best time to add a lot of fertilizers and organic matter it's during the autumn because as the frost expands and contracts the soil, it works well in. But uh, we'll be sending that straight off to you. And we've got another prize for our next Facebook Live, which is taking place on the 29th um, of this month. And we'll be giving away a uh, performance organics uh, compost as well. So just check on the um, description section of, our, of the Facebook page and we'll be able to work that out. I've got a final challenge. Got to give you a challenge. If you've not grown them before, Pumpkins. Pumpkins really work. I've planted one of my pumpkins in the compost heap itself. <laughs> I've got a full compost heap while it's breaking down. I've planted it straight in there because they do really well and they'll trail down. If you've not grown pumpkins before, do it. Now's the time. Uh, just watch these frosts again. You might want to make your own sort of like little protection. Um, I'll be doing them. I lost one of my pumpkins the other day. So uh, planting in pumpkins is great. If you've got kids, it's fantastic because you, and it's, everybody says, how do I know when the pumpkin's ready? Uh, it's turned orange. Um, they're really easy to grow in the gardens. Um, it gives you something to look forward to in the garden towards the end of the year. It's a magical time for the kids. And also if you grow your own pumpkins to be outside for the party and the celebrations of, uh, of Halloween, it's a really good thing. So that's my challenge. Try a pumpkin in your own garden uh, uh, this year. Well, I think I've covered about everything. 
Many thanks to Evergreen, Miracle Grow, and Levingtons for uh, 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 enabling me or bringing me here to be able to talk to you and give you some of my, my gardening um, uh, knowledge during this time. I'm sorry we're missing out on Chelsea, but you can do your own Chelsea things. The, uh, the power and the magic of gardening is with all of us. It's our own small plot of land on this earth and we should make the most of it. Being outside with the beautiful weather that we've had, the scent, and we know that gardening makes us feel happy and healthy. I'm David Dominey. Thank you very much. Thank you.